There exists a puzzling manuscript that dates back to the 13th century, though the year of its creation remains unknown. This book contains spells, potion recipes, and a full-page depiction of the devil, but nobody knows who wrote this book or why. Today, we separate fact from fiction looking at the origin of the Devil's Bible, aka the Codex Gigas. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to another episode of Red Web, the podcast all about mysteries, the unsolved, the unknown in this world that we live in. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, and joining me hearing about this mystery for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. I don't care. Historians, scientists, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Burn the damn thing. <laughs> There's just, Ooh. most likely, yeah. this is written by just some kind of demonic worshiper. Okay. See, this is why if I was to ever become a person of power or the, you know, the president or whatever, uh-huh. I would instate a take no risk policy <laughs> across the board. Okay. okay. And things like this, uh-huh. take no risk. All right. It's gone. So you're saying step one, you become president of this free world, this United States. Yes. And you say Stockholm, I want the book. Yeah. I want it burned. Yeah. That'd be I'll a part of my campaign. <laughs> <laughs> the demonic What's your book platform? Is demonic book gone. Burn. No risk. Yeah. Oh my God, I can see it. But man, I am super excited to be covering the Codex Gigas because it is the season. It's my favorite month of the year. Tomorrow, as of the release of this episode, is Halloween. And so what better time to be leaning into it? But also, that reminds me, last week, I wanted to give a little week lead up. The Halloween special is out where we went to the USS Hornet. We talk about the history, some ghost stories that are famous on that ship. But then we also explored it. We went all up and down some of those 17, no, excuse me, 19 decks 19. of this ship. We some got of them are below water. Not yes. like submerged in water, but like just below water. Right. Like if it was a Titanic situation, it would have been, yeah. but it's, yeah, yeah, not, yeah. it's not, thankfully. No, no, no. But how something that big and heavy floats, it's, it still blows me away. Wild. But Fredo, I got to just tease the task force. Yeah, you yeah. ran into some, some moments I, some of your first encounters, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't explain it. I still can't. Uh-huh. And honestly, even the slightest bit of those situations escalated. I was gonna hot eject out <laughs> There's a moment. of the of this place. There was a moment where you're like, I'm off the show, I'm off the ship, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was like, real talk. <laughs> if anything else happens, yeah, to further this situation, yeah, I'm out of the ship, out of the show. Like out of the ship, out of the crew. (laughs) God, man. It it was a good one. I I've been there before on another ghost hunt, and uh, this was so much more fruitful than that one. There were times that I was actually startled by sounds that had gone on, some of the tech that we had brought with us. It was fascinating. So if you task force haven't seen it yet and you want to check it out, this is one of the rare video podcasts that we have. So you can go watch us as we sit just below the main deck as we do the podcast. And then we explore very many of these hot spots that we that I had not gone to before. I don't think they allow a lot of the investigations in some of these spots. But anyway, you can check that out at youtube.com slash red web pod or use the Rooster Teeth app. And if you are a fiend for ghost hunting and evidence and you want to explore so much of our footage first members will have access to some deleted scenes and we're going to upload some of our raw uncut untampered with footage so we're going to make that available to first members so you can pour over that if you want you want to spend some halloween going over some spooky footage it will be there for you to take a look at and to become a first member go to redwebpod.com slash first it's the number one way to support this show it's 5.99 a month it all goes straight to us there's no middlemen it's basically our Patreon, our in-house Patreon. So anyway, that is the Halloween special. But without further ado, let's talk about the Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible. Have you ever heard of this, Fredo? No, but I have seen Evil Dead and... Yep, that is a very good comp. And it just did turn out well for anybody, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I'm very interested to see like what's actually in the pages. Yeah. Uh, This is a very old book. 
I've given you a couple images, like one of the book next to a man, so you can what, see how yeah, big it is. It's huge. Some pictures of things that I'm going to talk about here in a bit, but Task Force, as always, if you want to check out the visuals to this thing, you can Google it, but we're also going to post it on our socials yeah. at Red Web Pod. I mean, I've got a lot of questions, really, now, and I can't wait for them to be potentially answered. All right. But, like, just credibility, you know yes, what I mean? That type of thing. Sure. Who made this? Where is it from? Oh, uh, yeah. Why does it exist? What's in the pages? How does it kind of interact with today's life? Uh, Great question. If that, like, I don't know. I love uh, it. Curious. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the description of this thing because it is vivid, right? There's a lot to talk about. Then we're going to talk about the history, the known history, because it has been traced through time for its 800 years or so. And then, of course, the theories and legends that surround this mysterious text. So, of course, let's dive in. This is the Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible. It's the largest known medieval manuscript measuring about three feet long. Okay, 92 centimeters, and weighs 165 pounds, or just shy of 75 kilograms. That, That's a man right there. That is shy of my weight. That yeah. is wild. Yeah, it's a dense one. It contains 620 pages. Too long. <laughs> too long? Too long. I, I'm I, reading the Stormlight I, Archives. That is that is a light read. Too long. That's a Your light read to me. Your went right out the window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Immediately. Right. Right. I'm, I'm not is, getting a passing. Is there a spark notes on this <laughs> yeah, one? Yeah, I'm not getting a passing grade on this book. That's too long. <laughs> I'm used to Brandon Sanderson, so this is a light read for me. It is aptly titled The Codex Gigas because that translates to giant book in English. The pages are made of 320 sheets of vellum which is made from young animal skin or membrane. Young? That's got to be like certain Supple. age. I, I suppose so. There must be some sort of elasticity sort of thing here. Mm, yeah. Uh, it is believed that in the case of this text that the animal skin that was used was that of a donkey or calf skin. Vellum essentially refers to parchment which can be made of any animal's skin. But the pages here measure 36 by 20 inches, and altogether, this book is nine inches thick. Since one animal provides about two sheets of vellum, this would mean it took around 160 animals worth of material to complete this book. I was just about to say, what's the math on animals? Because that's not, that's a lot. It's We're talking be a lot. That's some demon math. You've yeah. heard of girl math on the socials? This is demon math. Yeah. I mean, look, especially hundreds of years ago that's money it is money 100 percent money and a Back lot then, of livestock was worth way more 100 percent, and a lot of effort too yeah this stuff is handmade a lot of you know i don't know i don't pretend to know anything about tanning but it goes right i mean a lot today, of i mean there's so many automized like machines yes. that just try and make these mundane tasks in everyday human life easier back then it's a lot more manual mm -hmm. 100 percent now, when it comes to the length of the book, it's quite long, but it seems that there were a few more pages in addition to the 620. And archivists have observed that it appears that someone intentionally cut some pages out. We'll talk a little bit more about where those pages might have gone and what they might have contained. Reminds me a little bit of Doctor Strange, where you have some missing pages out of a forbidden text because yeah. it has something desirable on it. The Codex Gigas contains the entire Latin Bible, copies of historical texts and writings on medical practices of the time. It also contains instructions for exorcism. Near the end of the text is a calendar. This calendar has festivals and saints days, which are days in which specific saints of the church are celebrated. The calendar also contains a necrology or list of deaths with 1,539 listed death dates. According to the National Library of Sweden, only 2.5% of these dates have been identified. They are only dated by month and year, but researchers believe that the book was created somewhere between 1204 and 1230. They were able to conclude this because they were able to identify various people from these death dates and famous figures lined up kind of accordingly. They were able to conclude this kind of date range by looking at the identified persons, that two and a half percent, but by also looking at famous people who weren't listed in this. Basically, any famous person that would have died in this time zone would have been listed in the book. And so since certain right. people were missing, they said maybe it's then this time range. Either way, most of the names, interestingly, are in check. I mean, look, that's bold, man. It's a big roll of the dice. Something like that either greatly gives you credibility or drastically gives you none, right? It's the same people that are like 20, 20, 
the giant tsunami is gonna hit the entire west coast it'll be demolished doesn't happen and they're like all right but 2022 and you're like bro you lost me right done chapter one i was out right exactly Mm -hmm. now this book contains a lot of different things and that's why so much mystery and intrigue surrounds it but it only continues right the book even contains five pages specifically with confessions of sins asking for mercy just before it shows a depiction of heaven which i've given you a kind of close-up version on the far right there there's a picture of what they drew to be heaven and unlike the rest of this book these pages in particular were written in all capital letters mm-hmm interesting like i guess like what is the evil side of that right this seems Ooh. more like a catholic thing right yeah or, or it's just sure. like hey i'm trying to you know like when you go to church and you go to confession you try to absolve yourself of your sins by verbally saying to a priest mm-hmm. what your sins are and then you do your hail marys and your prayers and whatnot and he absolves you and you go off and you, you do all that but like it seems like it's something like that which yeah. would be more of a like Catholic tradition. Yeah. So, I'm, so my mind is like, why does this evil book care about, or why is it evil? Right. Yeah. yeah. Why we'll is it evil then? That. Or like, yeah, yeah. Why is it like, hey, we want people to confess their sins to us? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because you're right. Off the rip, especially for heaven, because it's displaying heaven. Yes. Off the rip, you're right. It does feel like a collation of information, some personal writings, like somebody trying to confess their own sins, but also trying to collate a lot of information from the time period, whether it be medical practices or just death dates of people. Yeah. Now, where the devil side of things comes in is actually the very next page. So where that man is standing next to the book, on the left side, you see the depiction of heaven, which I've given you like kind of a, a zoom in yeah, of zoom it. in version of it. On the right side, you see this depiction of the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's nicknamed the devil's Bible specifically because of this full page depiction of the devil following the affirmation depiction of heaven. So the devil is drawn with an ermine loincloth, and ermine is something that only royalty would wear. Ermine is similar to mink, but you'd recognize it as the soft white fabric with black dots evenly spaced throughout. This is very tropey, something that you see yeah. lining the robes of royalty, and I've given you a picture of that so you can kind of see what that is, but ermine is essentially just like white with like those black dots. You see yep. it in like see king it. robes yeah. and royal like shawls and things like that um, hmm. so his loincloth is that material i mean i guess it's trying to say whoever was the ruler during the time or just rulers during that time were the devil potentially you know? or vice versa yeah, yeah, yeah uh one of the theories is that because the devil's wearing this royal material maybe it's the prince of hell or that Ooh. the devil is in power in some play or that this person is perhaps themselves worshiping the devil. It could be taken a lot of different Dang, ways. Dang, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jillian actually had a fun fact for this one, and she's throwing in a little movie fact. Twilight shows the depiction of this devil somewhere in the movies. Why? I don't know. For what damn reason? I don't know. They rip people's heads off, though. I saw that scene. I yeah. know you talked about that the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So continuing on with what is contained in this novel, this book... After the portrait of the devil, there are pages on magic with spells and potion recipes on curing illnesses and catching thieves. We'll talk about one in particular. There's a spell that tells the reader how to kind of reduce a fever. And to do that, you must adjure the bloodthirsty 150 claw dino or dino, and then encourage it to sleep like a yearling lamb in order to reduce the fever. This is where I'm going to do what they said not to do in the mummy and read from the book. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You want me? Okay, here we go. It says, KXK, Pater Credo, Lord Ne Ifu, More Against Fevers, Fexis Arex Master Dino, Blood you drink and meat you eat, and in blood you are washed, but collect 150 claws, and lie down in a place like a yearling lamb. Sleep now and forever and ever. Amen. Somewhere in Europe, a seal just crack the open. <laughs> right. You know right. what I mean? A tourist is exploring an old uh, cathedral <laughs> right. or some sort of uh, burial mound and uh-huh. something went... <laughs> and they're about to get possessed. <laughs> right, And that's right. because Trevor just read from the damn book. You should read from the book. Read <laughs> from the book. So I did translate those two Latin lines. The first one was, Father, I believe, Lord forbid. And then the third line, the second Latin line, was the master of the field, Dino, or Dino, how it's spelled. 
But either way, that's just a very specific example to show that there are some pieces of spells and magic within it, basically how to do otherwise normal medical things like reducing a fever. Like I'll take any type of new recipe to like heal fevers and ailments and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Did you know? It's just look. It's a quick Google. Oh, search. a Fredo fact. Did you know that? Like, have you ever had like? Okay. <laughs> I grew up, all right. He's so putting a lot of conditions ahead of this. Well, he's a lot a of asterisk marks, okay? But yeah, yeah, growing yeah. up in the, in two different households, Filipino and a Mexican household, uh -huh. I was always told if you got a fever, sweat it out. Sure, yeah. It breaks a fever. That's yeah. not a thing. It's not a thing? It's not a thing. Well, your, your partner, who is a nurse... Probably saying, nah, it's not a thing. But that's when you like wrap up in blankets yeah, and stuff and you to just like sweat out to break the fever. Right, you encourage doesn't the do heat. Anything. It doesn't. No, oh. it's not a thing. So I've just been mm. uncomfortable, just like for that's, no reason. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. uh, put that in the Codex Freitas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you say it out loud, it makes perfect sense. You, of no, course, that's not a thing. It, it makes sense to me. Your body's heating itself up. Why don't you externally heat it? It's but trying would, to like how would that kill cool the virus you, with heat. I mean, obviously, it, I, I think it takes a dangerous level of heat to kill a virus, but I don't know enough about the human body to yeah, dispute what he's saying. Yeah, I really. <laughs> oh, is, he's frowning. Is he about to prove his own codex <laughs> correct? We might not know. Uh, looks like he just did. Mm. Mm. Hey, nurses in the uh, task look, force look, are going to be I don't know. Firing They're saying off. it's not as not necessarily a thing. Okay. Jury's still out, it sounds like. I don't Task think Force, it's a let thing. us know. I don't think it's a thing. Those buff medical minds out there gotta let us know. I think it's in the category of like, hey, you just ate, can't swim for another 15 oh, okay. minutes. Mm. Right. Because of, yeah, it's like old wives' tale stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I only eat Task before Force. I swim. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I stay so trim. <laughs> you know what? You know what I imagine? And look, winters I, are I, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I just a long tangent. His here, hands up. His hands up. I just imagine, okay, just because, like, yeah, I mean, look, okay, we lead the task force, okay, so we're like a level above, both on paper but physically. But I think that there's a large room of task force members. They all got there's these nice fancy desks, uh, sit stand tables, all that kind of stuff. And we have this balcony in which we come out every once in a while. And I just came out and I went, "Yo, it's sweating." <laughs> Is yeah, the sweaty yeah. break a fever? <laughs> and then you just hear hundreds of clicking and clacking as the task force members go to town on yeah. breaking this. Yeah, um, we're like the two Muppets that review things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, but we come out and we just ask questions. Yeah. And then they shout back to us exactly. various a cacophony of answers, mm -hmm. and we never get a clear answer. So I'm just saying, that's why I envision right now task uh -huh. force, and so type away. Yeah, type away, <laughs> let us know. Coming back to the Codex, not Freitas. Gigas. Yes. Uh, in addition to the drawing of the devil, there are many ornate illustrations of letters, spirals, animals, and flowers. And to add to the intrigue, the entire text appears to be handwritten in the same handwriting throughout. Modern belief is that there was one author behind the entire text. At one point, it was believed that multiple writers might have assisted in the creation of the Codex Gigas, but the handwriting is so uniform throughout that it shows no signs of tiredness no change in mood, no shift in health. It is so fundamental, like a font. It is so consistently the same that it's almost inhuman or it must be one really well-trained person. Damn. Yeah. Like, imagine... I can't write the same write, letter twice at yeah. all. Like, my name looks Imagine having bad. to write hundreds, what, 600 plus pages. Yes. And having to just be not necessarily immaculate, which is honestly kind of worse. You have to match what you've been writing the, the yep. entire time. How many? How many? How Bro, much? Sometimes was I write away? my T's different just right. to, just to spice it up. Do you think like they woke up one day and was writing and was like, "Oh, I gotta throw this vellum out. It's expensive, but I my T's wrong." Dude, yeah. You know, or if they spill a little. I mean, coffee think, on it. If you think about it, you, I mean, you, you, I mean, look, you're joking, but yeah. I mean, right? Dang. Like, but also, and I do want to say this too. We're used to typing. Christian's typing right now. And I mean, he's clacking away. Yeah. And like, and so I never really practiced my handwriting. It's still like not great. Even like 100, like 200 years ago, people day, were writing day. beautifully. Look at the declaration, yeah. you know, yeah. John Hancock. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, maybe it was just a broader skill back then, especially of a scholarly type, somebody who was well read and like actually could write because that was its yeah. own skill set back then. But 
Either way, though, consistency is very impressive. Yeah. I do want to say, though, at the time, it was common practice for multiple scribes to contribute to transcribing a text. But due to the uniformity of this particular handwriting, a lot of scholars have believed that it's unlikely that multiple people were on this one. The uniformity of the text led some people to believe that it was written in a very short period of time. Because, you know, as you get older, your handwriting changes, your arm, your muscles, things change. But also you get kind of better at it. And so this kind of fuels one of the core legends surrounding this text, that it was written all in one night. More on that later, of course. What? But that would be notably impossible, which is why it is such a popular legend around this text. No way. Ain't no way. Oh, yeah. We're going to break that down actually right now. The National Library of Sweden put it this way. With the idea of one person writing this text, they said this, quote, if the scribe worked for six hours a day, and wrote six days a week, this means that the manuscript could have taken about five years to complete. Oh. If the scribe was a monk, he may only have been able to work on it for about three hours a day, and this means the manuscript could have taken 10 years to write. As the scribe may also have ruled the lines to guide the writing before he began to write, it probably took several hours to rule one leaf, this extends the period it took to complete the manuscript. The scribe also decorated the manuscript, so this all means that the manuscript probably took at least 20 years to finish and could even have taken 30, end quote. Reasonable assumptions all throughout. 20 to 30 years to write this thing, which adds even more allure to the idea that this was written in a short period of time by one person, fueling the idea of what we're going to talk about, yeah. the legend of this single night devil-inspired writings. Wow. Yeah, and that doesn't even include all the drawings that are within this text. That's just yeah, it's, yeah, I see the, drawings the rulings, stuff. the writings, and guess, some of the decoration. So I guess someone's, someone could be drawing. I don't know if there's multiple people. Like someone, someone drew and like then somebody there's an wrote. artist and then like someone that's painting it. But that's still decades of work. Yeah, Minimum. it is. Yeah. I mean, look, man, there's a lot of things I just go, I don't like doing that anymore. And I can't imagine... I guess like Think of the hand cramps. The hand cramps. Oh man, they they would they would have a buff hand. Yeah. One tough forearm. I can't like what is what is there something that I like to do that I've always I mean, video games, but even then you have a variety of different games that you play. It's like possibly your variety is the subject, this, right? The chapter. I'm just trying to think of like one thing I'd wanna do consistently for twenty years. This feels like Damn. the culmination of a lifetime of diary ing. Yeah. You know, dear diary, this is what happened today. Yeah. But with a kind of a specific focus. This is this is someone's life. Yes. This definitely. is what this is. And that will fuel some of the other theories as to who wrote this and why. But again, we're gonna get into all that. But before I do that, I think it's important that we cover the history, kind of how it came into modern being, and who has kind of had their hands on it along the way. So among the first pages of text in the Codex Gigas, it says that the Podlegitsa Monastery pledged the book in 1295 to the Sedlik Monastery in Bohemia, now the region of the Czech Republic or Czechia. It is unknown where the text came from before that. That is the earliest known accounting of this text. As we mentioned earlier, it is believed to have been written between 1204 and 1230 based on the necrology written within the text itself. Later, the monks seemed to be low on funds, and it was then purchased by another monastery before becoming considered one of the wonders of the world, according to the National Library of Sweden, and gaining the interest of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II in 1594. So this thing immediately is off to a colorful history. Yeah, people all over the world are like, let me take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Let me see it. I mean, look, the amount of work that went into this, yeah, for sure. I mean, even if you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, you know that this took a lot of effort, yep. a lot of knowledge, a lot of time, and that alone is worth a lot of value. Yeah. I mean, look, this thing, it just spews these fanciful stories that mm -hmm. people can uh, essentially like make up about it or just actual facts about it. Yeah. And then that will just spread just about like the demon book that was written in skin. Boom. Done. Oh, yeah. It you know inspires I mean? so much intrigue already. Yeah. I mean, look, there are movies that are made today that have less story than that. I mean, you even mentioned Evil Dead. That's predicated yeah. on a, a book made of human skin yeah, yeah. that sucks up a little bit of blood every time. It's got those teeth, mm -hmm. sucks in some blood, and then someone decides to boldly read from it. 
<laughs> they just kind of fumble out some Latin. Right. And then off and then, it goes. Yeah. yeah. Again, I'm now thinking about somewhere in Europe. <laughs> you know, someone's going, Oh I'm, my God, who read from the book? <laughs> I'm saying, man. Now, what's interesting about the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, it was said that Rudolf also owned the Voynich Manuscript. If you don't remember that one, we did a whole episode on that topic. But it's another mysterious medieval text. This one a little bit different, not so sinister. It had pages full of drawings of mythical plants and beings, plants strange to our planet. But it seemed, and it also, by the way, had an unknown language that has yet to be cracked. So it seems like this zoological kind of, what's the word, or to cultural book about plants and herbs and things that are strange to us in an unfamiliar language. It is a wild book in and of itself, but it just goes to show that Rudolf was interested in these ancient, mysterious texts. Yeah. I mean, look, people like to collect things. You know, oh, this man. person had money and power, so you're like yeah. collecting weird books. I like collecting Pokemon cards, you know? You'd be the opposite of this emperor. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You'd collect it to burn it. Well, I, yeah, I would get possession of it. Well, I would hire someone to get possession of it mm -hmm. and burn it. I would be nowhere in the vicinity of the right. thing. Right, lest you be possessed. Right. Yeah. So Rudolf II took it to his castle on loan in Prague due to his interest in the occult and was particularly interested in the portrait of the devil. It's the most iconic part of this book. I mean, that's why it's named the Devil's Bible after all. But he never did return it to the monastery and died with it still in his castle. Flashing forward a few years, at the end of the Thirty Years' War, the Swedish army took the Codex Gigas to Stockholm, where it remains to this day. This war went from about 1618 to 1648, and it started as a dispute between the Catholics and the Protestants before expanding politically, involving many European countries. The Holy Roman Empire had lost the war, which gave their estates sovereignty, and Sweden then took the book, among many other things, as a spoil of war. And then, again, the transition of ownership of this book continues. While it was at the Royal Palace Library in Stockholm, Sweden, a wildfire broke out on May 7th, 1697. Now, before the fire reached the library, the librarian tasked some of the employees with saving books from the fire. The Codex Gigas was among the few books considered important enough to be removed, and it was subsequently thrown out the window in order to be saved. See, that was someone that was smart. Not the people trying to save the book. Someone was trying to burn that book down. <laughs> okay, so that's right? what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. A mysterious fire is going, yeah. I know what's hey, in there. a mysterious fire, uh -huh. and they go, that this reaches... It'll burn the whole thing down, including that book. Yeah. You didn't get to it. I see That's so heavy as hell. I see someone at the bottom of a tapestry with like a big lighter going, <laughs> Oh no, a wildfire! <laughs> and then they oh run away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So after that, it stayed in Stockholm, but it did move around a little bit before reaching the National Library of Sweden, also in Stockholm, where it now remains today. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Did you know that there's ways that you can give back by simply playing video games? Fredo, I know you love games. Now you can give back with them. I play games all the time. You're telling me I could be giving back? Absolutely. All the time? All the time. Well, in this moment for Extra Life, the children in your community need your support. Children's hospitals rely on donations to serve their communities and the kids they treat. We believe that when you change kids' health, you unlock a world of possibilities for their future. So, Fredo, play the games that you love while raising critical funds for kids treated at member hospitals of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Extra Life is proud to have grown into a successful community-driven cause gaming program, having raised more than $100 million in the last 15 years. Look, I know you're out there playing your games, mm -hmm. your fall guys. Your Call oh, of yeah. Duties, Click right? And clack. You're catching them L's. At least, oh, at least, no. hurt, at least, just sculpt into a good cause. L for a good cause. Yes. Right. Or maybe W for a good cause. I don't it know. It could be. If you're lucky. Let's be honest. No, you're not catching dust. L's for lucky, yeah, right? Yeah, right, L for lucky. Tons of L's on my side. <laughs> now listen, by joining Extra Life, you are becoming a change maker for children's health. Be a hero for kids in your community, Fredo. We have a Red Web segment coming up every year. Our parent company, Rooster Teeth, does Extra Life. And we raise money for Extra Life and the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. But this year, 2023, Red Web has got a doozy of a segment to help raise money for these children. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a spooky time oh, yeah. where we're tampering with just uncomfortable things for us. Yes. Yeah. We're yeah, going to try to so. 
keep, I'm going to keep it vague. We're going to tease it, right? We're going to try to tackle some of our fears. We're going to read some spooky stories. And some of the donations that will help the children will also be set up to uh, scare us, right? Yeah. Let's just keep it at that. Yeah. Be like an hour of heightened fear. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> Christian's in the background. <laughs> this man's going to get Very got the most. Very enthusiastic woo. <laughs> um, but anyway, Task Force, sign up for Extra Life today to play games to change kids' health. Thank you very much. So this leads us now to the legends and theories. Despite Codex Gigas' storied history and popularity, much about the book is still unknown. There are many legends, myths, and theories surrounding this book. Many questions, just like you asked earlier. It's unknown where it came from, who made it, and what purpose it ultimately serves. But we're going to try to talk about who created this, some of the details surrounding that, as well as some of the curses that are surrounding this particular text. So one legend says that a singular Benedictine monk, Herman the Recluse, created the Codex Gigas. The story goes that he broke his vows to the church and sinned sometime in the 13th century. What sin he committed is unknown, or it was so terrible that the monks kept it from the records to keep it a secret. Either way, Herman was said to be locked away, immured, while he was still alive as a punishment. If you've never heard that word before, because I haven't, no. immured means that he was walled up, alive. He was put inside a wall and then walled in. Similar, basically, to that Edgar Allan Poe story, uh, the cask what? of Amontillado. Have you so, ever heard of that? I mean, so you just instantly suffocate and die? Uh, not instantly, slowly. You would be chained to the wall and then you would be bricked in. And so you would be in a very dark, heavily enclosed space. I'm sure it's not oxygen permeable, Deprived, but it's not yeah. like a vacuum either. And so I'm sure you would essentially starve or dehydrate to death. Jesus. Yeah, it's it's brutal. Um, but again, it's a legend. We, there are yeah, many other yeah. corners to this thing. Would so, it be more brutal to do that or be cemented to the ground except for your face and then you're being fed and hydrated. Oh gosh! I don't know. Why I just thought. I about think. That. I think the first one, so I could just be done in a week or two, right. and, and not be, you know, kept alive with my face out, Jumanji style. Yeah, that sounds. Oh, that's just terrible. I don't know why I popped my ass. I do not terrible. like the idea of not being able to move like that. <laughs> right. That freaks I know me annoying out. Annoying that would be. Claustrophobic central. Ugh. Annoying is a very light <laughs> word. Yeah. yeah. I would yeah. say a little bit more than annoying. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're sitting in the ground, the <laughs> foundation of a building, <laughs> face sticking out, going, "Well, I'm annoyed." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the legend goes on to say that as the final brick was laid, Herman asked the abbot, or the leader of the monks, for a deal for forgiveness. And in order to redeem himself, the abbot said that he had to create a book containing all of human knowledge for the monastery in one day. There are other versions, though, that say that Herman had to create a text that would bring glory to the monastery. And there is yet another version that says that he was not walled up yet. He was basically under threat of being walled up. The punishment had been decided but not taken out yet. And he was given an entire year to complete the text. Either way, these are all very short timelines. Yeah. This is, this is a wild story. Yeah. The whole writing in the day, I must just scratch that off the list. Because it's, it's, if he was for forced sure. to write this in a day to save his life, it would not look this good. It wouldn't look this good. No. Enter the devil. Because you're right. Factually impossible to do in a day, yeah. impossible to do in a year. But as the legend continues, as he was getting desperate, midnight was approaching, he prayed to the devil who, in exchange for his soul and a portrait within the book, he assisted Herman in finishing the Codex Gigas before the morning came. So since the portrait portrayed him wearing the ermine loincloth that we talked about before, some think that it is meant to show the devil as the Prince of Darkness. It's hard to believe, but the name Hermanus Inclusus Another word for recluse or punishment is among the lists of deaths in the text, the necrology that we talked about. Hermanus inclusus is referred to in there. So it would mean that Herman the recluse almost was listing himself within the book on November 10th in particular, though it's unknown what year that would have been. Many have made notes and left their mark on the Codex Gigas across history. This could also be why there are many pages dedicated to admitting to sins because if this story is to be taken at face value, yeah, the writer all is their sins. exactly expunging themselves, not only writing knowledge of human history and everything they can to perhaps bring glory to the monastery, but also expunge themselves of their own wrongdoings. 
It's also theorized that Herman may have dedicated his entire life to creating the text as a religious act and as a recluse rather than as a punishment. To me, this makes a lot more sense for a monk or anybody yeah. to kind of, as you kind of indicated earlier, Fredo, to, to spend their life writing such a thoughtful, thorough text explaining spells, magic, medicine, knowledge, their own sins, documenting deaths over the course of the entire span of this, the history of writing this. It's a life's work. It, sh it certainly is. They were even copying religious texts, and perhaps they saw that themselves as a way to overcome their sins. Yeah, I could, I could see that. Uh, yeah, I lean that way way more, for yeah. sure. Oh, 100%. But it's just weird then, though, that you have, like, demonic things, right? Yeah, but I mean, the Bible still refers to the devil and talks about it. Good point. I'm not fluid in Latin. Most of this book is written in Latin, and yeah. I'm sure it could be translated. I'm sure, in fact, because this book is actually available online, like each page has, has kind of been, been scanned. I'm sure there are translations of it. Um, so Task Force, if you want, you can dive in and go ham on that if, you, if you'd like. It's too much text to cover here. It's a lot. Hundreds um, of pages. But suffice to say, whoever made this, whoever wrote this text was massively talented, though no other pieces or texts by them have ever been discovered or at least connected to them. I will say, though, this doesn't seem as evil as I thought it would be. Right. It does sound like an evil thing, yeah. but it's mostly inspired by the legends surrounding the intrigue, right? All the gaps in knowledge are filled with legends is basically what's going on. There are a lot of curses attached to this, and we're going to go over like a collection of them, and mm. that does add a little bit of darkness to it. But ultimately, yeah, it's it, uh, it sounds a lot more sinister than it is. So, speaking of that, as a result of its connections with Lucifer, another popular legend is that the Devil's Bible is cursed. It appears that those that hold on to the text are destined to face tragedy. And we've talked about a few of them already but we'll dive in with more detail. So after the monastery sold the Codex Gigas, they fell from the Hussite Revolution. This war was fought between the Hussites, a Czech Protestant group, and the Catholics. Later, as I mentioned, the Holy Roman Emperor kind of, air quotes, borrowed the book and never returned it. And not long after, he was overthrown. As he grew older, he suffered from depression and paranoia. Rudolf II was stripped of power nine years before his death in 1612, and then the castle was plundered for the text. So you could almost point to this text as the downfall not only to his power, but then his death a few years later. I mean, a popular book like this, for sure. But then again, like a lot of kings do have downfalls, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, well, you, everybody dies. Yeah, everybody you know? dies, and especially back then, people could overthrow people, yeah. you know? I mean, how you had ships that where people would just mutiny, you know? And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, and someone new is in charge. Yeah. So. I mean, it's it's an interesting timeline. It, it's hard to say that it's not coincidence because if he got the book in 1594 and it seems that he passed in 1612 and then he lost power nine years before that, so about 1603-ish, then it's like a 10-year timeline. So yeah, 10 years time after getting yeah. it, he lost power. 10 years after that, he passed away. So, you know, that's a 20-year difference. Do you attribute it to the text? or, you know, the curse, or yeah. is it coincidence? Either way, he's involved. Later, during the fire of the castle in Stockholm, a witness, oh, this is kind of morbidly hilarious. So there was a witness that claimed during this fire, right? They're running around the library, trying to save some of the books from these flames. A witness claimed that when this particular book flew out the window, not only was it saved from the fire in that doing, but it landed on somebody injuring them pretty badly because no. it is a big, a big heavy bug. book so that kind of only adds to the idea of a curse because of course out of all the time yeah. for this to happen not only was there a fire but then being saved from the fire it said well i'm gonna do something and it hurt somebody some say that this is also when some of the pages went missing that they flew out because it was probably damaged in some way when it fell and that maybe the pages were accidentally lost rather than being intentionally cut out, as some scholars have believed. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So we don't know exactly what's lost, but we will get into a pretty strong theory as to what was lost in just a moment. But coming back to the fire, the cause of the fire itself still is a mystery as the fire watchers. Now, this is a conflation of accidents. The okay. fire watchers were not at their assigned locations. And so many attribute this to the cursed text that the fire started when the fire watchers weren't there and that the book hurt somebody. And on top of that, the punishment for the fire watchers not being there was that they were later executed. 
Holy! So there's a lot of, you know, darkness around in this particular moment. I guess they left their post. At the, the worst time The possible. worst time. I mean, they right? Like, how many times did they leave their post and no fires happen? Mm-hmm. In 1858, this is centuries now later on, long after the Codex Gigas had made its way to Stockholm, there was a story of it published in the Takroliga Anecdoter, or in English, the hilarious anecdotes. The story says that one of the library employees fell asleep one night and was locked in the building. He saw books fly from their shelves and actually revolve around the Codex Gigas. The morning after he was found terrified, and he remained so in a terrified state for many years afterwards. Years later, a librarian named August Strindberg claimed to hear voices emanating from the book. Strindberg was reportedly obsessed with the Codex Gigas and would bring friends to read from it for hours in the middle of the night. Pause. Red flag. That's a red flag friend right there. 100%, man. Come. I want you to read with me from a book that even, speaks. Even then, it's just like... Pass. You got, you got some enablers, dog. You don't have true friends. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Your true friends would be like... Let's see what old hey. August is up to. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's like, got a talking book. August, my dude, you should stop doing this. This isn't right. Instead, yeah. they're like, I guess I'll go hang out with August and read the pages again. In a more real way, though, this would be exactly like Talk to Me. This would be a group of friends rolling up next to a haunted book and oh, saying, like, yeah, yeah. touch the pages. Look, look, he's floating. His eyes are rolling <laughs> yeah. back in his head. God, what a good movie. <laughs> this is such a good high to be possessed by a demon for five seconds. Fantastic horror <laughs> Very movie, movie if you haven't seen it already. Yeah, check it out. Basically, the premise is that there's a haunted object and these teens are addicted to allowing possession of themselves for up to 90 seconds. Of course, that is what teens would do because there's no mortality in them yet, but... I mean, maybe that's what's happening with this Codex Gigas and Strindberg. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah talk to me was a lot better than The Pope's Exorcist with <laughs> Russell oh, with what? Russell Crowe. Talking about Russell Crowe's? <laughs> yeah, Russell Crowe's. <laughs> he's, he's out there doing like some kind of Italian accent and he's like... It's also, is that Anthony Hopkins as well? Or was that a different no, Exorcist this, movie? No, this came out this year. Oh, that's... Okay, this is... And it was Russell Crowe. He's the Pope's Exorcist. And okay. And there's a yeah. demon that he has to exercise. What's the Anthony Hopkins movie? That was good, though. Terrible The movie. one in Italy. He's a priest. He's exorcising The somebody. right? Yeah. yeah. Oh. You gotta watch it, but please continue. Oh, no. I was saying it's an absolute trash movie. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> shouldn't watch it. That being said... Like, I'm a spoiler. It's a trash movie. Okay. okay. Um, the story behind it was interesting. There's, like, a demon, essentially. Okay. But this demon was trying to possess the Pope's exorcist, Russell Crowe. Okay. Because previously, he possessed a high-standing, I guess, I would say, officer. Like a cardinal or something? In, yeah, like a cardinal in the, the church and use that person's power and influence to do all the evil things that happen in the Crusades. Oh, this oh. movie sounds awesome. Yeah, and that's then, a cool idea. Yeah, which is a great idea. And so it's like, I will now want to possess the Pope's exorcist uh, so I can, you know, do execute it again. some heinous, evil, massive plan. A so fascinating that, premise. Yeah. That premise is cool. Poorly executed. Damn. And then just, you just got Russell Crowe doing an Italian accent. Oh, no. No, don't touch it. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, bro, no. Russell no, Crow. Rusty. No. Oh, no, Rusty Crowe. Go back to being gladiator. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maximus Aurelius. Yeah, that was a better Italian accent when he was an ancient Roman. Yeah. A gladiator. <laughs> Good um, he does play Italians, doesn't he? Anyway. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. So related to this curse, some believe that the missing pages of the text contain more occult practices and beliefs, which is why they were torn out. This is fascinating, and I didn't know about this going into this, but some believe that the pages contained instructions for the Devil's Prayer, but we were unable to find any information regarding what the Devil's Prayer might be or why they believe that. That's just kind of one of the longstanding kind of theories. Others believe that it was instructions for the Apocalypse. We don't know if that's how to start the apocalypse, if it's uh -huh. descriptions as to how to see it coming or what it will contain, but just information or instructions around the apocalypse. Others believe that it's some kind of knowledge that humans were not meant to have, i.e. it was torn from the book. Now, this is where we get to the rule of St. Benedict. This part is very fascinating to me. So, a note in the Codex Gigas mentions the rule of St. Benedict, a set of guidelines for the Benedictine monks, who we talked about a little bit earlier, but these rules are not found in the text. So, the National Library of Sweden has concluded from that that at least some of the missing pages may have been dedicated to the rule. 
Any of the text holders between now and the original author could have disagreed with this rule and been the ones to remove it. It's uh, it's gone through so many hands. Yeah, it's getting um, shuffled around. So like the original author puts it in and then any one of the authors after takes it out. That's upsetting. A book like yeah. this, you spend so much time meticulously putting it together and someone's like, I don't like that. I don't like and that so one. I'm going to take it out. Perhaps whoever tore it out disagreed with these guidelines, but again, to echo back onto when it was thrown out the window, it's likely that it took some damage. It's a 165 pound, three foot book fallen from however high up in the air, yeah, landing kinda... potentially on a man. Yeah. You know, it could be that some of the pages came out then too, but that concludes the main legends and oh. theories that surround the Codex Gigas. Hopefully time will reveal more about this intriguing text, but until then, it will remain a mystery to time with more legends filling the gaps than answers. Not as demonic as I thought it would Not be. Not as demonic, no. It's not like it's, um, you know, people interested in the occult are interested in this book, but it's not like it actively promotes the occultism uh, right. or, or the worship yeah. of the devil or anything. Uh, but it, but the iconography of the devil is one of the leading imageries coming from this text and so much mystery and intrigue surround it that and, and the idea of curses kind of fill in the air of like, well, we don't know about it. So let's kind of fill it in with with what could be. Right. And a lot of that just basically stems from that one page depiction of the devil. I'm surprised not more stems from the depiction of heaven right next door to that picture of the devil. But it's a fascinating book and one for the history books, to be sure. Yeah. I just walking into a room with this thing in it, it's probably it's just bigger than you. Right. And in, in terms of the story and the history and uh, how old it is, I couldn't even imagine. That's just something that just go. It's just a straight up wow. Yeah. You just look at it and go, my God, like this, look at this thing and yeah. all of its existence. Written in a totally different time, totally yeah. different century, 800 years ago. It's touched the hands of a, of a Roman emperor. And then that empire has since fallen. The language it's written in has since died. Yeah. Right. Like it is, if nothing else, a, an amazing footprint of history to your point. It reminds me, there's a painting, I think it's in the Louvre where somebody got a hold of this painting. It had been rolled up and put away and stored and transferred. And at some point in order to tuck it away into a certain trunk or whatever, it was cut in half. Someone took a sword and just cut down the middle of it horizontally. So that way it'd be small enough to store away. And it is now on display with that cut forever in it, obviously, because you can't yeah. undo it. Entropy is a thing, but it's like, Something so small, so quick. These missing pages, even like yeah. some some breath of time, has a permanent footprint, and you can just like I don't know. There's something so beautifully tangible that history manifests in that way. I don't know. Like I would love to just look at this book just so I can imagine the hands that have been on it, the people that wrote it, or the person, whoever. It is a beautiful mystery, intriguing right. as it is potentially dark. I this is just to me the perfect Halloween mystery to end this month on. Yeah. It was, it's very intriguing. It's, it's still, there's just so many mysteries out there, right? We've done hundreds of, oh, I guess we're creeping up on 200. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Episodes of Red Web, man. So a uh, big shout out to the task force. You guys are the driving force on, uh, Absolutely. you guys are the, the, the blood of this. The backbone um, and the blood. Not sacrificing anyone. Again, not a cult, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you guys are the blood life of this podcast. <laughs> um, we don't drink out of it. Um, but we still come across mysteries that are just so different than other ones. Yeah. You might be sure you could find similarities and everything, but like, okay, there's this demonic skin book. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's just wild to me. So, yeah, dude. Just last setting question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and task force members, uh, you know, you're figuring out the fever stuff. You wrote it down. This is a different comment. Right, right, I right. Separate an comment. That I want to answer to. We'll but file if, away differently. But, but if not, then you get two for one in it. All right. If you haven't researched the fever stuff yet. But <laughs> there's... There's a book in front of you. Got it. Okay. 50. Close your eyes and picture this yeah. task force, especially if you're driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's okay. a book in front okay. of you. Okay. Right? Just, it, it, there's no, like, kind of just looks like a bland book. Oh, okay. Right? It doesn't sway either way in terms of, like, emotion, colors, feeling, or anything like that. It's very bland. Just a babe. 50% chance that it is a book of wishes or 50% chance that it is a book of horrors. Okay. You taking that? The you, question I have is what happens if I take it or open it? Do I get a wish or do I get a horror? Do I uh, so do I they, get a take or do I get a give? So the is thing is, happening? if you open it, it's wishes, you get 
a ton of wishes, but if you open it, it's horrors. You get a ton of horrors. Yeah, what, is that, what does that mean? Like, are yeah, you possessed by something? Horrors. Is like a demon claw, crawl out of the book and just vibe with you? No, it doesn't need to be detailed. It's Some just sort of Tom Riddle diary. I mean, yeah. I would just, I would just go with the blank statement of like, you horrors. don't like wishes, yeah, and you're not gonna like horrors. horrors. Yeah, I've heard way too many uh, monkey paw stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'd go, that's a fascinating book, and immediately put it in a crystal case, right? I wouldn't touch the thing with my bare skin. Interesting. I would be, I'd be like, you know, listen, 50% chance of a wish come true and 50% that my life is a horror film, I'm out. Yeah, yeah. I like to dabble yeah, with that stuff. Yeah. I like to watch it from afar. Right. You know? I don't want to. No, I'm not getting involved. Mm. I've seen enough horror movies. I'm not even touching it. I'm, right. I'm walking away. I'm, nah, I'll it's straightforward. It like if, if you if you get wishes, it's wishes. There's yeah, no it's like. Fine. Oh, man. It's fine. Not yeah. for me. <laughs> walking away from what it. If it's I'm like, not a gambling man. What if it's like <laughs> How do you, 50 mean, 50 per person? Like you open it up and yeah, suddenly like yeah, a, no, it's, a it's, gold it's, brick falls in your lap. Yeah, it hurts per, a little bit, but you get yeah. Brick. It's per it's per person. Yeah. The mean like, do you try and get someone else to open the book? Be like, hey, could you wish for this real quick? Yeah. I, I ain't entering the cycle, man. No, no, I'm not it. touching the book. Yeah. That's the one thing I won't mess with. Mm -mm. Untold horrors? No yeah. thanks. Task Force, let yeah, me know. You open that book. It's going to be a resounding Ch note. Like, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to change your life, and you're just like uh -huh. forever. You don't got to worry about nothing. Okay, so what it is is you and I walking back out onto that balcony, yeah. asking the task force in the room, and everyone going a resounding no. <laughs> hey, we got a bug. <laughs> and they go, no. It's either real good or real bad. And then one brave soul in the back is going like, I'll risk it for humanity. <laughs> yeah. World peace. Yeah. Ah, my eyes. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, man. Well, again, reminder, thank you, Task Force, for sticking with us. <laughs> God, what a fun episode. What a fascinating hypothetical. Remember, again, if you haven't checked it out already, we got our Halloween special. We went to the USS Hornet. We had so much going on. And if you want to become a first member to support this show, get this show ad-free and a bunch of other kind of Patreon-style benefits, you can go to redwebpod.com slash first. You'll get some deleted scenes, some uncut, just raw footage from the ship, and then we'll do a follow-up. A little debrief. Once that episode has had everybody pour over it, we're going to go through the comments, look at your timestamps, if you've identified anything, any sound bites, any clips, any yep. stills, especially in that raw footage. We're going to collate all of that like we do every single year, do a special one off case files where we react to your reactions. Right. You guys are the eyes and ears. So, you know, get to it. Let's get tangible. And also, Fredo's desperate for you to debunk some of that stuff because <laughs> yes, for he had God. some experience. No, just the that is no joke whatsoever. Explain it, was weird. it They explain it to me. There's some weirdness. All right. Task Force, see you right back here next Monday for yet another mystery. Happy Halloween.